What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Sweetest name I know. No other name given under heaven by which one must be saved. One can be saved. So I am grateful that we have a Savior that's worthy of being bragged on. And he most definitely is. Thanks for coming today. Take your Bible, turn to Luke 15. Evangeline said she was going to pray. I was, going to convince, I was convinced she was going to say, God is great, God is good. <laughs> Let us thank him for the food that Pops is going to bring today, but no. Begin a new series today called Lost and Found. We are going to uh, cover the three parables of Luke 15. It will take us four weeks to do it. Um, I take one of them and I'll break it in half. And, but it's a... It, it is the lost and found chapter in God's Word. There are three words that you will find in it. Uh, lost, found, and rejoice. They're in each of the parables. And it had a, um, had a very much a truth. A parable is a, a story with a truth behind it. And uh, even though there is one truth, you will actually see the Trinity involved in it. So if you have your Bibles open to Luke 15, would you stand with us in honor of reading God's Word. <clears throat> Begin in verse 1. <clears throat> then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. I am grateful that people who did not know God but had issues and problems of, in life found their way to Jesus because they, they were hungry for something that was real. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained. I mean, they should have rejoiced. New Holland, if we had people come to our services who did not know our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I would rejoice. As a matter of fact, that's what we should be about. That's the job of the church is to take what God has given us and share it with others. They said, this man receives sinners and eats with them. To that, I say amen. To that, they said, oh me. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there is more joy, more joy, say it with me, church, more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Let's pray. Father, I, once again, I thank you for the privilege, and I count it an honor and a privilege to meet with your people, but Lord, that you would allow me to uh, preach the word of God. My soul is thrilled, but Lord, I have a weight on my soul as well. For Father, I want us to get what you wanted to share. I thank you for your truth. Your truth's good in any circumstance, in all seasons of life. You are the yes, you are the right, you are the amen. Lord, I pray that we would be open to what it is that you're saying. Not open just to hear it, but to let it find root in our heart. And Lord, that we would be willing for you, not me, oh God. I can only speak to ears. But Lord, for you to change us into glory, into blessing, into life, into good, into that which has meaning, into that which lasts. Father, I pray that we would... Uh, key on those words, the lost, the found, and the rejoicing. Speak to us personally, O oh God, and sir, we'll give you all the honor and glory and blessing. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You can be seated. In Luke 15, I call it the lost and found department in God's word because you'll see God fully and completely at work. You'll see today the parable that we're going to look at, the good shepherd, had 100 sheep, 99 were safe, one was lost, and 
that represents Jesus Christ, the one who came to be the good shepherd. John 10, he said, I am the good shepherd, right? So in the next story that we'll look at next week, we'll see a woman there who had 10 coins, but she lost one. And that's representative of the Holy Spirit who seeks until it is found. And yet, there, we'll look the next week at a story that you may know, and you may have heard it called the, the story of the prodigal son. But it's really the story of a faithful father who had two sons. That's why it'll take us two weeks to cover that, because we'll see one, the younger son, that you and I know is the prodigal son, but we'll also look in depth to the older son. And truly, when Jesus is preaching this parable, it, there are those that need to hear that they are loved and that they have value. Uh, he calls them the tax collectors and sinners. And, and we may look at a, a group of people today and we say, now that's a group of sinners. If that is true, I need to be a part of that group. Sometimes we look at ourselves and we think we've got it. And, you know, we, we pretty much agree with our own estimation of ourselves. We pretty much agree with our own opinions. I mean, if you're arguing with yourself, there might be a little bipolar stuff going on here. I don't know. <laughs> Schizophrenic, multiple personalities, but I know who I am. And that's why I'm so grateful for the grace of God that I didn't have to earn his salvation. He freely gave it for me. That, that it wasn't anything I could repay. It was God's bounty of love given to me, not for anything I could ever do in return, just because he loved me. And I'm grateful for that. I'm a recipient of that. But yet we understand and we know that there are some that we say, well, that's a pretty good person, and we look down on the O's that we don't agree with. Well, that's what the Pharisees were doing. They, they liked their life. They dressed up in the, the robes, and everybody could see them and, and knew who, really who they were, that they were religious people. They knew what they did for a living, and they also knew what they acted like when other people weren't around. They may have acted religious, but they're sinners like the rest of us, and it has a way of leaking out. Can I get an amen? amen. Now, it was easy for them to look at the, the tax collectors because they saw them as sellouts and thieves. And I don't know that other group, that he just lumped them all together and said sinners. But, but listen, church today is not for the holy. It's for those that are sinners who serve a holy God, who look for more of him and less of us. I want to come every time we meet together. I want to feel the encouragement. I want to feel the love. I want to feel the kindness. I want to see the goodness. But listen, every time I want to find more of him and less of me. I want to grow. I want to be challenged. I want to hear the Word of God and say, speak to me personally. I want to be cut wide open. I want, to have, I want the Holy Spirit to do heart surgery every time we meet together. I'm not there yet. You can probably agree with that. May we never get so prideful and boastful and think that we're so full of ourselves. Because if we ever find that place, we're going to, we're going to think that we're, we're not in need, but Church, let me tell you, we're in need. We're in desperate need. I'm not there yet. So Jesus shared these three parables, the first of which we're going to look at today. Look in verse number four. He says, what man of you? Which of you out here, the kind of person that you are, what do you value? He says, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? What do you value? What do you value? There are some things that we value more than others. That's natural, right? 
you value those things. But let me just ask you, do you know what you value most? My, my granddaughter's here. She's in the back. <clears throat> she came yesterday to me and said, Pops. She crawled up in my lap. She had under her arm Sugar Bear. And I tried to take Sugar Bear to play with her, and I wasn't taking Sugar Bear from her. <laughs> she had Sugar Bear in a headlock, and she wasn't going to turn loose. At that moment, she valued that more than anything else. And in our days, we say that we value certain things, but really there are certain days that we value one thing. Another day we may put something more, more higher than that, a higher place. And really, if you start looking at your time, if you start looking at your day, if you start looking at, at your thoughts, your actions or your reactions, you can start to sort out what you think you value. You may not value your job until you lose it. You might not value that very precious thing that you have until you lose it. Isn't it scary that there are things in our lives that we don't value as much until we lose them? We take them for granted until we don't have them anymore. I didn't want to do that with my parents. Both of my parents are in heaven. But I wanted to honor my father and mother. And I understood that I was a, 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 my, I was a father and a husband, and, and, and I had a, a job. I, I, I pastored a church, and and I understand that there were responsibilities and expectations and, 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 and all, but I wanted to balance it because there was something that I, that I said that I valued, but did I really value it? And I wanted to value it because I knew, you know, once they're gone, I wouldn't see them until I got to heaven as well. So what do you value? I would say that the Pharisees had a different value, but I would say that, that those tax collectors and sinners that Jesus was talking about, they may have had a different set of values, but they knew that something was messed up in their life and how they looked at things and what they, what they said was important. And they, they came to God saying, I, I really want that which is important. So let's look at this. There's 100 sheep. 99 are still there, but one is lost. I wonder how many businesses today would be tickled to death with 99% retention. Go to Walmart and ask them. If you could get 99% retention, would you be happy? They'd be ecstatic. As a matter of fact, they've got loss built, built in. They know it's coming. They know it's going to happen. And if they can only have a certain percentage loss, they're happy. But this shepherd, this good shepherd, loses one and says, this is not acceptable. He has value. 99% is not enough. Listen, what if you were the one? Would you want someone to love you enough to find you where you are? And bring you to a holy God who could change your life forever and ever and ever? I heard a pastor say this years ago, and it struck my heart. Two phrases. Would you attend the church that you pastor if you didn't pastor? And then he said, if you were lost, would the witness of your church be able to find you? I was the pastor. I got to be honest. If your mom was the one out there in the community that didn't know Christ, doing what we're doing now, valuing what we're valuing now, would we reach that one? We may be grateful that we have this many here. And, and trust me, y'all look at me. I love you. And I'm grateful that you're here. Amen? I am. Please come. Please, let's walk side by side through this part of life. I will seek to encourage you. You will seek to encourage me. We, we both know that we need each other. Let's be about God's business together. 
but we cannot be satisfied with that. May it never be that we're satisfied with that. Are you ready to hear the teaching of the Lord? The Lord says 99 are safe, one is lost. He says he's willing to go after the one. He values the one. I wonder as a church how much we value the 99. Let me, let me ask you, how much of our focus is on the 99 and how much of our focus is on the one? How much of our time is on the 99 and how much of our time is on the one? How much of our budget is on the 99 and how much of our budget is on the one? How much of our activities are on the 99 and how much of our activities are on the one? I hope this next one hurts. How much of our prayers are on the 99 and how much of our prayers are on the one? Jesus says 99 is not acceptable. I'm grateful for the 99, but there's one that's lost. The value of the one. Let's talk about sheep. This is a great illustration. Have you ever found a more dumb animal than a sheep? Uh, by the way, that's us. Amen. He's the good shepherd. We're just dumb sheep. Is that of offensive? Well, it might be offensive, but is it true? Oh, yeah. We can, we can be so... <laughs> oh, I'm trying to be kind and refined and it's not working. We're dumb. Why do we do the things that we do? Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the one I love. A sheep cares about what is right there in front of it. Bah, eat a little bit. They don't mean to wander. They're just dumb. They don't look around and say, hey, where's the rest of the guys? Let's stick together, guys. All they care about is what is right in front of them for them. Does that not sound like America today? The only thing that matters is us. What kills me, though, is when it leaks into the church and we want to make everything convenient for us. We want everything to be about us. What about me? What about me? What about me? What about me? Well, what about Christ? I gave my life to him. He didn't take me to heaven when I got saved. I, I'm here because there's a purpose in my life, and I'm supposed to love him. I'm supposed to grow in my relationship with him. I'm supposed to serve the Lord with gladness. A sheep is dumb because all it does is what comes natural to him for them and that will always lead you astray. They're dumb. They're defenseless. They get away from the shepherd, and they're out there with wolves. How is a sheep going to defend himself? Bah. Bah. A wolf comes, and he might give them up. Bah. I'll hoof you to death. I'll wiggle. And that wolf's going, lamb chops. <laughs> There's not a thing he can do for himself. He can't defend himself. And they're out there in the, in the wild. Jesus is the door. He's the good shepherd in the door. That meant when they were together in a pen together, the good shepherd would sleep in the door because the only way you could go out or go in was through him. John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes but to steal and destroy. Jesus says, But I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. Satan wants to steal. Satan doesn't want to come through the door. There are times that we're out there and we'll just go our own way and we'll find ourselves in a bad, bad place. Bad, bad. 
place. I'm sorry, I didn't plan that. It, that wasn't in my notes. <laughs> the problem with the sheep is, is they don't know how much trouble they're in. But the good shepherd says, I will leave the 99 to search for the one. No matter how difficult, no matter how long, no matter how frustrating, no matter how cold, I won't quit, I won't stop. As long as the mission is in front of us, I'm gonna go. That will tell you what your true value is. Are you willing to sacrifice for something that is of higher value than you? Listen to me, church, please, if you don't get anything else. The word agape means to see value in something, to cherish it. I praise God that, that my Lord was in heaven, safe and sound, hearing the glory of the angels as they, as they sang his praises. But there was something else that would, uh, was of value to him. And, and it wasn't something that he felt like he had to hold on to. He could leave heaven because there was something of greater value. And it took him to the cross. And he gave his life. And he never said a word. He never defended himself. But he gave his life a ransom. Because he saw value in me. And I don't understand that. He cherished me. I don't understand that. I know me. I'm not worthy of that. I don't deserve that. I can't pay him back for that. I know better, but I'm prone to wander. I am grateful that he would go to the extent that he went to for me. To walk the cruel path to the cross. To know that there was one, even in the twelve. ill intentions, but even the one that they thought was the best of the 12, denied him because of a little girl. In that moment, he had a choice. Peter had a choice, but he cowered down to a girl rather than standing behind the Savior. But yet Jesus was willing to go to the cross for him. Is there anybody in here that's deserving of what God did for you? But yet, he cherished. He saw, the, he saw that little lamb out there in his mind. He's cold. There are wolves that are out there. He could get caught up in the briars and the thickets. He might find himself on, in a cave or, or maybe on a cliff, a step from death. So he went to look. And look. He did without <laughs> because of the value. There is a, I'm a John Wayne fan. Any John Wayne fans in here? I knew there were some holy people in here. <laughs> I, I like them all. I think I've seen them all. There may be a B movie. He made a bunch of those B movies that I hadn't seen, but. There's one that's not well liked among people. It's called the searchers. And he doesn't wear the, he's not the white hat hero in that movie. But the Indians came and took his niece. And his motives were suspect. But he spent years searching for that little girl. And I love that in that movie. Snow, sleeping in snow. Tired, weary, hungry, but he never gave up the search. I'm grateful that my Lord's a whole lot better than John Wayne. But I'm grateful that he never gave up the search. Um, 
It would have been great if I said yes to him the first time he spoke, but I didn't. I can't tell you why other than my pride and my ego. But he kept calling me. He kept wooing me. I just praise God at the right moment, at the right time. I said yes. My life's never been the same. I'm grateful that he came. Look what it says. What man of you will not go after the one which is lost until he finds it? But when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. On a Sunday night, I moved out of a Nile, felt like my chest was going to explode. And that day, they just would give an altar call and you just were on your own. And I went to a, the altar, confessed everything I knew to confess, asked the Lord to do for me what I knew he promised he would do. I went down to that altar burdened, but I got up rejoicing. Because you see, what I think was Jesus was right there with me. And when I said, come into my heart, he accepted that invitation. When I said, be my Savior and Lord, he would be that when I was good or when I was bad or when I was indifferent or when I was hungry. It didn't matter. And I, I, I can't tell you how under conviction I was when I went down, but I can't tell you how rejoicing I was when I got up. I was crying going down. I got up happy as could be, turned around at the church, and never, all them were crying. And I'm like, time to be happy to me. And I got hugged by all those crying people, wiping their makeup all over me. And I got in the car that night to go home, and I told my parents, I said, I can't wait to go to school tomorrow to tell what everybody else what happened to me tonight. See, what happened that night was the Lord took me up and bore me on his shoulders and said, let's just go together. Because I couldn't have made it for the last 47 years if it had not been for Christ. I was 10. But praise God, he saved me. And he's been bearing me up. And listen now, he'll carry me all the way home. All the way home. Now, this is something you might not think about too much, but I want you to look on the face of the Lord, that great shepherd. He didn't beat up that sheep. He didn't spank him and say, you, you knew better, you dumb old sheep, you. He just bore him up, put him on his shoulders, and I believe the most wonderful smile. I don't know how many days it took him I don't know how many weeks. Really, there is no explanation. You could put whatever time limit you want to. But when he found him, he carried him home. And I believe there wasn't a weight or a burden to that. It was, a, it was what he came for. And when he got home, he said, Hey, friends, neighbors, we're going to have a party. And by the way, it wasn't mutton either. He didn't say, we're going to teach this one here. We'll eat him for dinner. No. He says, come, rejoice. Celebrate. Let me ask you, you're going to, what you value, that you'll celebrate. When was the last time you celebrated a soul lost and undone who found their way home? I think the greatest thing, the greatest moments in the life of the church is when somebody comes to know Christ. It is an amen, glory, hallelujah moment. It's just sad that it doesn't happen this more than it does. By the way, it's burdening my heart tremendously. I'll, can I, I'm just going to preach a verse at you. Let's just have a little good old-fashioned Bible study. Look at verse number 7. I say to you that likewise there is 
more joy. Now you can try to explain that away if you want to. You come up to me afterwards and you throw your theology at me. And I'm going to look at you and I'm going to say, more joy. That means, guess what that means? It means more joy. There is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. That means they're already found. Now, if this offends you, I didn't mean it. Yeah, maybe I did. That means we're the 99 just in here. We might have a few lost in here. I don't know. But let's say we were all found in here. We, we, we're, we're together. And let's say some, somebody's walking up on the wrong side of the tracks. I don't know what that means. Because I think we were all born on the wrong side of sin and life. But let's say somebody's out there and someone who loves meets that person, begins to talk and share and communicate in a kind way, share their heart, and doesn't invite them just to where the 99 is. Maybe they just need to tell them right then, this is what you need. And that person says, I agree with you. This is what Christ can do for you. Would he do it for me? Yes, he'll do it for you. Would you like to invite him into your heart to be your Savior and Lord? I believe I would. What verse 7 tells me is that Jesus says, hey, guys, I believe I'd rather go over there. There's, there, there's more joy over there than there is in here. Is that offensive? Is it offensive to you to say, hold on. God should be tickled to death that I'm here. God should be celebrating that I'm here. He loves you. He loves you with an everlasting love. By the way, there's not one thing you can do to change how he feels about you. He loves you completely and totally. But he said, every time somebody gives their heart and life to Jesus, every time there's a party in heaven. Y'all hear me? Get the band cranked up. Angels, let's hear something. And I will tell you that those saints that have gone before us, those saints that are there who know the value of salvation, they're celebrating. One more in the family, one more in the fold. Is that not what we ought to be about? It's not about how many possessions we can gain. It's not how many friends we can have on Facebook. It's not how many Bible studies we can go through. It's how we're using what God gave us. I pray that every one of y'all have peace in here. I pray that your life is like a fountain. It's overflowing with love. I really do. I just want some of that to sprinkle on some others. For the next four weeks, we're going to be preparing for who's your one. I just want to know how much prayers are you going to be praying for that one? Are you really, are you really going to buy into this? Or you'll say, well, the pastor will do it. I'm an under-shepherd, but listen, you got your own flock too. When... Mark knew, I, I, I've been ready to preach this for a while. Mark, Mark and I were talking, and he always lets me know early on in the week what the music's going to be. He's very kind, very respectful. And I, I went to my desk, and I, he, he had laid it on my desk, and I knew the offertory hymn was going to be Rescue the Perishing. And I thought about that. And, and can I be honest? Right off the bat, I thought, you know, we've sung that song so many times, I don't know if those words are really going to resonate. Because we've sung it, and we think about singing it, but do we really concentrate on the, the words and that let them flow from our heart when we sing them? But you know what happened? I began to sing it. Rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. 
I began to think about that and said, yeah, that's right, Lord. That's what we're here for. I'm glad we sung it. Now we need to live it. What is the value if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? If you're here today and you don't know Christ, he's coming for you. He wants you. That's why he came to this earth. That's why he died on the cross. But God's love is there. And there is not love without choice. He died for the world, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But he also said that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are you open? This has been a day God's looked at. Is this your day? Are you ready to receive Christ? Don't be caught dead without it. Eternity's too long, too long to be wrong. If you're not sure, you need to get it right today. Don't let your pride, your ego get in the way. Give your heart to Christ. It truly is the gift that keeps on giving. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you will speak to your people. And maybe some that are here today that do not know you as Savior yet. I pray that you speak to their hearts, that you convince their hearts, Lord, that you begin to, to weigh on them the way you did on me. That word wooing, drawing. Father, draw us away from our sins. Draw us to you who can cleanse us. The only one the only name under heaven by which we must be saved. Father, surely in this room, as many people are, that are here, there is someone that hasn't done business with you, that hasn't been honest and given their heart and life to you. Father, speak to them. Let them know we're not here to condemn. We're here to rejoice. We find value in them as well. Lord, do what only you can do, and sir, we'll give you the praise and the honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.